We continue chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 of the Bhagavad Gita. And this is the conversation between Sri Krishna and Arjun. And Sri Krishna is talking about reincarnation. He's talking about the triumph of good over evil. And in these two verses, 9 and 10, he goes a little deeper into the matter. So Sri Krishna says, He who knows my divine birth and action in its subtlety, after leaving the body, no longer goes to another birth. He comes to me, O Arjuna. They who have freed themselves from attraction, fear and anger, many purified by the ascetism of knowledge absorbed in me, have come to identification with me. The very um, first verse that I read out, verse 9, has frequently been misunderstood by those who are devotees of the deity called Krishna. They often think that when he speaks of here, the divine birth, that being referred to as the mysterious birth, the circumstances under which his birth took place in Gokul, his life in Vrindavan, where he danced with the milkmaids along the river Jamna, the adventures that led to him being crowned eventually in Mathura and then becoming the king of Dwarka or the role that he played in the Mahabharata, including the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. So those who are worshippers of the deity called Krishna read this as a um, instruction where he says, if you worship me, you will no longer go through the cycle of life, death and rebirth. Instead, you will come to me. However, if we read the verse closely and we read the verses before this, the ones preceding this, where Sri Krishna was talking about the tradition, the lineage. And he was talking about being identified with the cosmic self. And that this eternal wisdom would reincarnate again and again in order to overcome ignorance. When we see this from that angle, it is very clear that here, we are not talking about a deity called Krishna, but we are talking about consciousness and that the teacher of the Bhagavad Gita identifies with this universal self, with this cosmic self. And so if we understand this divine process in its subtlety, which process are we talking about? The process in which one is born, goes through life, dies and is reborn. If you understand this process, and I use the word understand in, so we would say in inverted commas, what it means is when you know the process through direct experience. Having that experience, you would no longer 
take another body. There would be no need for you to take another body. You would understand the play, the mysteries of life as well as death. And having understood these, you would learn how to manifest the desires or renounce them so that you would no longer come back to this plane of existence. Therefore, would no longer need to take another birth. So this is the process that he is talking about in this verse 9 in chapter 4. In verse 10, this is elaborated upon. How do you do this? You do this when you free yourself from attraction, which is another word for attachment. Fear, which is another word for aversion. Anger. These are the samskaras, the colorings, the glaciers. If you can free yourself from these samskaras, get pure knowledge and be identified with that universal self eventually. That is possible. But first, you need to purify the mind. So this is the process here that is being explained further in detail. The process of how to attain the cosmic self. How to go beyond this cycle of life, death and rebirth. If we would look at our famous diagram in which it is quite well illustrated, you have a mind which is partially mortal, comprises of active and latent consciousness, which is the storehouse of uh, samskaras. And in order to manifest these, we need a body and we need a playground. And this world here is the playground. When you understand this process of how the mind comes forward and takes a grosser form, and at death, the body drops and the mind remains, the subtler part remains. In order to reach the subtle most, which is the self or center of consciousness, we need to learn to let go these desires or these samskaras. In our last session, we went into a fair amount of detail um, about desires we spoke, which is another word for samskaras, and how they continuously bring us back to this plane. And so here in these verses, Sri Krishna says, when you understand this entire process moving outwards and inwards, Pravritti mark and this way inwards, Nivritti mark. When you understand this entire process through direct experience, you do not return to this plane. You can attain moksha. I know we have spoken about this very, very often. We have looked at this diagram very often. There is naturally a, a gap between intellectual understanding and direct experience. And uh, that is why we keep repeating this again and again. Any questions on this or on these two verses?
Okay, good. Then we can just continue. So verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4. Whosoever in whatever way submit themselves to me, I confer grace on them in the very same way. Human beings in all different ways follow my path, O son of Pritha, desiring fulfillment of actions. Many here sacrifice to gods. In the human world, accomplishment comes quickly as a result of action. When we sincerely seek the highest, by the highest I mean seeking that foundation of our lives, seeking that which is all pervading, seeking that pure consciousness, even a glimpse of it, when you surrender, then grace comes to you. Surrender here is not implied to a person, a teacher, or a person representing a tradition or, or you know, um, surrendering to somebody that you think is more knowledgeable. It's not referring to that kind of surrender. We have always talked about reasoned faith and not blind faith. Not blindly doing things, but with reason. In this case, it would be with the direct experience of that that pervades all of life. Universal consciousness. Pure consciousness. Cosmic self. These are different words for the same thing. That essence of this is the same. That is life itself. And when you surrender to this, grace comes. You may do this in different ways. Since the universal self, the cosmic self, manifests itself in different forms, it appears in different forms. If you just think a little bit or contemplate a little bit of, about the world around you, you will see that this cosmic self manifests itself in so many different beings. From the humblest form of life, be it a small little ant, a little insect, a bee, or more complex forms of life, you know, beautiful trees, animals like elephants, tigers. Human beings also have, take so many different forms. If you just think about the variety forms we have, even color. It's so beautiful. So it takes place in so many levels, this manifestation. Naturally, the path cannot be one. There are many different paths. So we should not be dogmatic about this. We can attain that same one, that highest pure consciousness through many, many different ways. They all lead to the same eternal one. 
it is so unfortunate that this same eternal one has become a dogma that so many religions start wars against each other, murder and kill in the name of the one. One eternal wisdom. They give it different names and they argue and fight about this. But each person is unique and each person has his own unique path as well. Some people are maybe not ready for that eternal one, for that highest. They are very caught up in fulfilling desires in this material level, this material plane, this plane of existence that we all share. And in order to be successful there, in order to fulfill their desires, they worship deities. And that is okay. This existence, this plane of existence here is also important because it allows you to fulfill your desires. And we spoke about it the last time that this is a part, a natural part of spiritual evolution that keeps taking place. If we restrain ourselves too much, we are not aware of our desires, our samskaras, and we do not allow them to manifest, then we get stuck. We get stuck in this cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. To break out of this cycle, you have to learn either to manifest the samskaras or learn to meditate, learn to witness these and to burn them up internally. The second path, learning to meditate and burn these, intern these samskaras internally, is the harder path. It's not easy. It's very difficult to master. In the next verses, Sri Krishna explains further this process. Any questions so far? In, in verse number 12, Radhikaji, yes. uh, what is this word? Accomplishment to? Fulfillment of desire. Manifestation of those samskaras that you have. So, um, if you have certain desires, you're coming to this plane in order to fulfill them. To accomplish something, a goal. It's just another way of saying samskara. And that is why the human body is considered to be one of the highest forms one can take in order to manifest these samskaras. And it is often said, you know, uh, those who aspire to uh, heavens, one says, that is not freedom. That can end up person being lost in heavenly celestial pleasures. So those who want to attain, they always say it is best to take human form. In the human form, we can manifest our desires. It's a gross form. We can manifest our desires in this gross form and then you know it is done. The celestial forms are actually disembodied forms. So imagine you do not have a body. When you dream at night, 
is a similar process. You're unaware, you're dreaming. And in your dream, you have a glass of water because you're thirsty. That's one way of satisfying your thirst. But when you wake up and you have actually a glass of water and you satisfy your thirst, it's completely different. So, in order to satisfy your thirst of water, it's best to drink a glass of water. In celestial planes, disembodied planes, you cannot do that. So, that accomplishment referred to here is manifestation and fulfillment of samskaras. When you experience it, it's done, you are free from it. And that's why there's a great importance of uh, having a human body, having acquired one, it is a great privilege. Therefore, one takes care of the body because it's your temple, it's the instrument with which you can fulfill desires and uh, allow your desires to manifest. Okay. And, and it also speaks, you know, th this sounds a bit strange, fulfillment of actions. Mm -hmm. We normally talk about fulfillment of desires. Mm -hmm. is, is it a similar thing? It's the same. You see the word action, karma and samskara is sometimes used, you know, they're interchanged. They're used to mean the same thing very often. You know, mostly in colloquially it's become very fashionable to say, oh, you know, these are your car this is your karma therefore you get you know this is the result you know that's why you're miserable this is your karma what they actually mean technically is that this karma what you are suffering is the result of your samskaras but we we use them in a way you know where it's, we're not using them in a correct technical manner they're just used you know interchanged but what it means is Fulfillment of your samskaras by allowing it to manifest into action. Okay. There is a certain... Um, uh, it's important to learn the technical terms and... Um, to use them correctly. But it's often in poetic form and the Bhagavad Gita is poetry. And so very often in poetic form, one takes a certain creative license. So this is not a technical uh, scripture like, for example, the Yoga Sutra. This is poetic and also aimed at a different audience. It was put together, I would say, because most of the Bhagavad Gita uh, draws heavily from the Upanishads. So it was put together for a lay audience. It became a part of the Mahabharata, and the Mahabharata, as many of you know, was always read out or narrated or acted out uh, during festivals and so the teachings were conveyed in a, a story form uh, a form which is more appealing to all people including children so naturally the language differs but in a scripture like the yoga sutra which was meant purely for those aspiring to attain higher levels of consciousness, these technical terms are used very carefully. So we should keep that in mind that, yes, there are technical terms and should be used appropriately, but in scriptures such as these, um, they may not follow that strictly. So we go to verse 13. 
Sri Krishna says, I have created the fourfold division of humanity on the basis of their qualities and actions. Though I am its creator, know me to be the immutable one who does not become an agent of action. So here, in this verse, it is very clear. He says it very clearly that this is not about a person, whether historical or legendary. This is not narrated by a deity or a god. Very clearly, know me to be the immutable one means that whoever the narrator is, he is identifying with the cosmic self. Surely a person or one single person would not create the fourfold division of humanity. This has come throughout uh, history of humankind. This kind of division has existed, not only in India, but also here in Europe and in almost all ancient societies. The division being uh, Brahmins, who are custodians of knowledge. The equivalent, the European equivalent would be the clergy. Those of you who have studied a bit of European history or for example the French Revolution, you know that they were called the four estates in Europe, in English. They were known as the four estates. And in India they were called the four castes or the Varna system. And this was not based on uh, some arbitrary uh, form based on birth, but rather on the nature and the quality of the person. So those who were lovers of knowledge, those who were capable of more abstract thinking, who enjoyed learning for the sake of knowledge, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. These were Brahmins. Kshatriyas, warriors, were those who by nature had the stamina to go through certain situations, to take care of others, to protect others. Very often people say, so oh, Kshatriyas, these were aggressive people. That's not true. If you see the qualities of a king, it's not only an aggression. A good, wise king protects his subjects, takes care of them, builds, uh, you know, things for his subjects like hospitals and... Uh, water supply, canals and, and electricity, yeah, that will be modern, but in those days perhaps not electricity, <laughs> but providing um, infrastructure, form of roads, schools, etc. So this requires a certain quality of taking care of others. This in the, the European version or European term for that was of course the, the nobility. They were supposed to take care of the people. Then came the Vaishyas, those who engaged in business, agriculture. These people generally owned some land or conducted uh, forms of business, trade. And uh, moneylenders, for example, were also a part of this um, third uh, caste or estate. So um, this also existed here in Europe. The fourth were those which did not come into any other category. If you did not fall into the, uh, you know, the above three, then you came into the last or the fourth category which was the working class. They did the menial jobs, laborers. And um, that means they were not really having the ability to uh, 
engage their minds in a certain way, so they were given physical tasks to perform. And um, this was also there in Europe, those people who were right at the bottom of society from the menial tasks. So, why is this so important? Why does it bring it up here? Because irrespective of the kind of nature the mind has, consciousness pervades all. But it manifests in these different forms. And on the basis of these, we can manifest our samskaras, live out certain samskaras. If you have a very sharp mind, if you're very good at knowledge and learning, it's likely that you would not be very good at physical uh, jobs or tasks. If you have an ability to, uh, for example, you're good in administration, taking care of people, then it's obvious you may not want to be sitting around a whole day with books and reading and learning. So these, to know your own nature was very important. What happened, however, was that like many things in life, starts out good but ends up being corrupted. The entire system, the fourfold division of humanity or in sociology it is known as the stratification of society became very rigid and those who were born into Kshatriya family remained there even though perhaps they did not have an inclination to do that kind of work at all. Perhaps they were more inclined to, to learning and knowledge and then they were stuck in that situation. So that corruption took place, for example, in India, um, where the Brahmins oppressed the other members of uh, society, and uh, particularly the, the fourth uh, class, the Shudras, who had really no um, way to defend themselves uh, suffered a lot. The same happened in Europe which led for example to the French Revolution where people were fed up of the clergy and the nobility and uh, revolted against that system because they were totally exploited and miserable um, even starving. So, the misunderstanding that has taken place has been a great tragedy because a lot of people have suffered unduly due to this rigid system of society and unfair and rigid system, I would say. Fortunately today, things are changing and people can shift around much more easily. So even if you were born in a family where your parents are very educated, in the sense that they are Brahmins, and you say, no, I, I would like to, you know, there may be professionals like lawyers or doctors, and you say, no, I want to join, I want to start a business. From a perspective of these from the caste system or um, the estates, the person would be dropping from a, a Brahmin family and joining a Vaishya family and uh, participating in business. But it's possible. If that's the inclination, why not? So in those days, of course, there was certain prestige um, associated with these levels and um, this also created a, a great deal of tension and um, was partly unfair but 
when you were naturally belonging to a certain system and you could live out those desires, as I said, if you come in, were born in a family of professionals but decided that you need to, to join a business or you want to start your own business because you like to create things of your own, you know, you, you like to build up stuff, or you have a very entrepreneurial mind, and that's what you enjoy doing, then you can live out those samskaras. And one who can live out the samskaras can grow, can develop. And one who is not in, in the right field cannot grow and cannot develop. So that's why the importance of knowing your own nature, your own tendencies. I have often heard people who go and attend some Bhagavad Gita classes or I have heard of teachers who have somehow, um, you know, interpreted this as they, in a very rigid form, saying, oh, the Brahmins are the superior ones and everybody else, this is a, a caste system. And somehow they want to keep this caste system in place. And the interpretation is, in fact, incorrect. What it really is are the natural tendencies and qualities that each one has. And if one can live out these qualities naturally, spontaneously, then one can evolve spiritually as well. And when that desire to evolve spiritually gets really uh, very strong, then you have adhikar, you are qualified, and then it does not matter from which level you come from, whether you're a Brahmin, you're a Kshatriya, you're a Vaishya, or a Shudra, it does not matter. Some legendary sages came from very, very humble backgrounds. There are stories of butchers becoming great sages. These are good stories because they make it very clear that anybody can attain, provide he or she is qualified, is really ready to attain that highest level of consciousness. Okay, any questions on that before we go to the next ones? Uh, I have for a slightly unrelated note, is there you know any correlation between these four uh, divisions of humanity and the four uh, you know divisions of uh, time in terms of Kali Yuga, Satya Yuga, etc. Is it, is it like a corresponding division in time? Uh, in, no, in terms of cycle? no, I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. So verses 14 and 15, Sri Krishna continues, Actions do not smear me, nor do I have an attraction toward the fruits of action. He who recognizes me thus is not bound by actions. Even the ancient ones who desired liberation performed actions with this knowledge. Therefore, you too should perform the same ancient act as done by your predecessors, the royal sages. This chapter is called um, uh, Jnana Karma Sanyas Yoga. So it explains the relationship between Jnana 
knowledge, karma, action, sannyas, renunciation. For many people, these are completely three different things. But if you look at this, contemplate on these verses, he says, actions do not smear me. He's not, he is untamed by action. Nor do I have any attraction towards the fruit of the action. So one who is identified to the cosmic self does not <clears throat> have an attachment towards the fruit of the action either. So the one who recognizes me is not bound by actions. Who is the one who recognizes me is that meditator, seeker, who attains a direct experience or realization of pure consciousness will be freed, will no longer be bound by his actions. So, such a person can perform all action but not be bound by it. Even ancient ones who desired liberation, the word used here is mumukshu. Mumukshu is a beautiful word. It means those who desire liberation. Not everybody is mumukshu. A lot of people are saying we want to learn yoga, we want to do meditation, but they are not mumukshus. They are not desiring liberation. So those who desire liberation, they perform action. Quite contrary to the popular belief that you need to renounce everything, in inverted commas, renounce everything. You do not. You continue to perform actions like the royal sages. Why do they give the example of royal sages and not of uh, yogis, as you know, ascetics uh, living in jungles and uh, in caves? Because the royal sages were like King Janak, was a royal sage. He performed his action, but he was completely unattached. He was witnessing. This is Sakshatkar, the state of a witness, one who is fully realized. So, sannyas or renunciation does not mean renunciation of action. It means renunciation of the fruit of action. It means you do not get attached. It's an internal renunciation. And this is what sannyas really means. It means non-attachment. The Bhagavad Gita has often been said to be the middle path, path of moderation. And indeed it is true, it combines the knowledge of the eternal with the knowledge of the ephemeral, of the transitory. And it does not say you need to renounce external objects, worldly objects. What you need to renounce is the attachment to those worldly objects. As we know, you can renounce physical objects, external objects, but still be attached to them. This does not bring us very far in our development. Therefore, it seems wiser to manifest samskaras that need to be manifested, continue to live in this world, perform actions by attaining the state of sakshatka. This may obviously not happen immediately, but that's what one can work towards. What 
happens mostly is that a lot of people misunderstand this idea of sannyas or renunciation and they always think of it as renunci uh, renunciation of the physical objects. And when they do that, they miss sight of the fact that a householder can also attain the highest. In fact, it is more likely a householder who can attain the highest because he is free. He is not bound by vows. He does not have to renounce physical objects. If need be, he can use these physical objects in a way that does not create obstacles for him. While having taken sannyas, as in having taken the vows, it becomes very difficult when you suddenly realize that there are certain desires that need to be manifested. Samskaras that need to be lived out it becomes very difficult. The Indian tradition from the Upanishads has always favored the concept of ashrams. There are four ashrams or phases in our life. First is Brahmacharya, approximately 25 years, where you focus on development, focuses on the child developing into a grown human being. And a lot of what we learn, we learn in our childhood. We don't learn much more later. The next phase or ashram is Grihast Ashram, phase of the householder, where you can live out these samskaras or desires in a way that they do not create obstacles for you. The third phase is Vana Prastha Ashram. Vana is forest, Prasthan is to go to so that phase where you go to the forest do you actually go to the forest well in the early days the people who went to the forest the forest dwellers were those who were a little bit older and they now devoted their time to to forming gurukuls where they taught children so in our modern context we can see this as those who teach others, who share their knowledge with those who are younger, or as we start uh, retiring from our work, whatever that livelihood that, that you, you know, your profession or raising children, you have gained certain experience, life experience, and you can do voluntary work. There are a lot of charitable organizations where one can do that. So this is what is meant, learning to grow beyond the, the circle of family, expanding your circle to include others into it. And then the fourth stage or ashram is sannyas ashram. So now you see that in Sanatanda, in the Upanishads, the idea of sannyasa was for the very last phase in life so that we have fulfilled already our desires, have matured through our life experiences, have learned to expand our circle of love to include others to grow out of our own petty ego or family and, and expand our family to include others as well and when that happens through naturally one matures and begins to ask deeper questions so this was the idea, 
behind the four ashrams. The idea of sannyasa was um, to take sannyasa very early in life was not a part of uh, the Upanishads. The teachers of the Upanishads were all householders. Therefore it says, Perform your action like your predecessors, the royal sages, or even the sages from the Upanishads, all householders. Any comments or questions to this? Okay, so we come to verses 16 to 18. The verses 16 to 18 are probably some of the most important verses in the entire Bhagavad Gita. I would say these are these red letter verses. You know what red letter verses are? You know, some of you may have seen uh, the New Testament. There is a version of the New Testament and, uh, in which the words of Jesus are marked in red. So it's called red letter verses here. I mean that these are really very important verses here. And they are at the same time quite difficult to understand. So if you do not, it's okay. Verse 16 says, What is action? What is inaction? Even the wise are confused in this matter. Therefore, I shall teach you concerning action, knowing which you will be freed from the foul world. One should learn of action. One should learn of action that is opposed to right action. One should learn of inaction. The reality of action is deep. He who sees inaction in action, and he who sees action in inaction, he is the one endowed with wisdom among human beings. He is joined in yoga, a performer of complete action. The action that we are talking about here is karma. Karma and samskaras. Here we are talking about karma. It is the deeds that you perform in life all the time. And so these verses analyze karma. This analysis of karma is also given in the Yoga Sutras. In the Yoga Sutras it is explained differently. Here it is explained in a different manner. The content is the same, basically, essentially it is the same. So it says that three kinds of action, or it analyzes in verse 17, action, that's what you need to learn, action, then action that is opposed to right action, and inaction. I personally find using these English words very clumsy and even more confusing than it actually is. So I'd like to use the actual words. One should learn of karma. One should learn of vikarma. Vikarma is opposite. And one should learn of a karma. So what is karma? Karma is normal action, whatever you're doing. Doing your duty, for example. That's performing action. In a sense, it is right action. It's action that is somehow positive. In the Yoga Sutras, it would be called white karma. The next one is vikarma. That is action that's opposed to the right action. So, it is karma or action that makes us miserable, 
that strengthens the bondage of karma. It strengthens this web that we are in, you know, where it's, the world is like a spider's web, then, then we get stuck even further by doing this kind of action. It may be called negative, or in the words of the Yoga Sutras, it's called lack action. And the third is inaction. A karma. So what is a karma? A karma does not mean sitting around doing nothing. It's actually not possible at any point of time to, to do nothing. Because the moment you're doing supposedly nothing, thoughts arise. And we know that thoughts are nothing but a form of physical action. So, and you get attached to those. So the moment there's attachment, there you go. That's karma. So, this last one, a karma, is extremely difficult to understand. In the words of the Yoga Sutra, it's called not white, not black karma. It's neither black nor is it white. Most of our action is mixed. It's a bit of white and a bit of black. But for the sake of analysis, it's been analyzed here. There's action, there's karma, there's vikarma and akarma. Who is the wise one? Wise one is defined here. The Sanskrit word is the one having a sharp buddhi. Such a person is called buddhiman. This word is also used in colloquially in India, in Hindi and other regional languages as well. Buddhiman is somebody who has a sharp buddhi. And how do you define somebody with a sharp buddhi? The one who sees karma in a karma. And one who sees a karma in karma has a sharp buddhi. <clears throat> So, this can still be a little bit confusing. So, if you don't follow, it's alright. It's when you have this experience in meditation of being a witness. You could be sitting with your friends, talking, maybe playing a game, and you're witnessing this action which is happening around you, in that moment, you are seeing a karma in karma. And when you're sitting in meditation and you see a lot of images and thoughts in your mind, then you're seeing karma in a karma. So these are the two different scenarios provided you are able to witness. That's why the very first line says even the wise are confused in this matter. Even those having really sharp buddhis, those who have attained, even they have a hard time explaining these things or even understanding them and communicating them. What happens when you do understand this law of karma. And when I mean understand, I don't mean intellectually understand. But what happens when you realize how the law of karma works? When you have solved these, this mystery, you got it, you know, you understood it. You know how it works. Then you are freed from Freed from what? The, the word used here is foul word, world, and that's not a very nice translation according to me. The actual word in Sanskrit is ashubhita. Ashub is that which is not auspicious. So when you master, understand, are unable to use this law of karma intelligently, to get yourself out of this mire, this web of karma which keeps dragging you further and further into bondage. 
then you will be freed from all things inauspicious. All things that lead to suffering. So these three verses are extremely intense, uh, very, very deep. They require some contemplation. We can perhaps revisit it again next time when we start. If you have any questions about this or any doubts, comments, I was just thinking what you explained of action and inaction. It sounds a little bit like the external world and the internal world. Yeah. Especially in, in verse 18, that you see the, uh, the stillness, so to say, in the world, and you see the activity in the internal world. Yes. Is that a right right? Uh, yes, very subject? good. Yes, very good. Thank you very much for um, giving it different words, a different um, angle to explain it. Um, maybe that helps some people uh, understand that. Good, uh, good, good uh, insight there. Because we also speak about meditation in action, right? Mm -hmm. That would probably also be yes. another way of explaining this. Yes, that's another translation of this verse, uh, meditation and action is another way of putting it. I just had one question about verse 17, mm -hmm. where it talks about opposed to a right action. Yes. So what is a, what is a right action and what is a wrong action? Yes. Because it can mean many, many different things to different people. Yeah, of course. Uh, right action or karma is that action that leads you away from ignorance. Avidya. And vikarma or wrong action is that which strengthens your ignorance. Of course, uh, when you are already ignorant <laughs> or you are sort of swimming in your ignorance in Avidya, then you may not be able to distinguish between the two. And that is why, of course, one needs a bit of guidance sometimes. But for a jani or a wise man whose buddhi is sharp, he sees clearly what action is white karma and what action is black karma, also known as vikarma? And he sees, okay, this action, this will take us away from ignorance, and this action will lead to more suffering and more ignorance. And then, of course, there is a karma which is beyond both this, both of these. <clears throat> which is the state of the witness, the one who witnesses all, who is not attached, complete non-attachment. Param Vairagya. But how does it actually matter when the action itself, uh, if it's right or wrong, is, I think, not so important as is the attitude which is behind it and the attachment which comes out of it. So, like you mentioned that also before, um, that if, in a way, I take it to the very extreme, if Hitler had done this all with his great awareness, all his wicked actions, mm. would be not be able to be even qualified as right or wrong. They're just actions and they, they play out. So how, how is that explained? Can that, explained? that would be when Hitler would be performing wrong actions, no? actions opposed to right action, that is Vikarma, mm. but... He would be a meditator of the highest order. And so in that case, it would be a karma. It is not white, not black. 
So the action we are referring to is like you said, it's not mere physical action. Karma, the word, is used, is interchanged. It's used for physical action as well as when it is colored. So it leaves an impression. Anything that leaves an impression in your mind and strengthens the samskara is an action or is black or vikarma, opposing action, wrong action. Both these leave impressions in your mind. A karma does not leave impressions in your mind. You are a witness. Therefore, the example given, if Hitler would have uh, been a witness, it wouldn't have mattered to him. It would matter to others, but not to him. He would not be leaving, his, his actions would not leave or strengthen impressions in his mind. That would be a karma. That would be the third kind. That would be here. It's called inaction. Okay. I think we should revisit this the next time. These three forms of karma. This is explaining the law of karma. How karma operates in our lives. How we get ourselves more and more miserable. You know, if you're in a quicksand and you keep moving, you know, you go deeper and deeper inside. So, it's like that. If you do wrong action, you go deeper and deeper inside. You do right action, right action, it will, it will also create an impression. It will not, you will not get moksha. Right action also causes samskaras, will also strengthen the samskaras. You will not suffer. But you will not be free either. You will get freedom only from a karma, that is, inaction. Learning to be completely non-attached, irrespective of what you do in the external world. Always witnessing. And as you can imagine, that is not um, simple meditation, but a very high level of meditation or uh, of sakshatkar, complete self-realization. Okay, we're 10 minutes past and um, we can stop here. If anybody wants next session on the Bhagavad Gita next Friday, we can revisit this and if people are contemplated and have questions on this, we can, we can take them up again. And for everybody else, um, we meet again on Sunday, same time, Mastering Pranayam. We will do some of the techniques of Advanced Pranayam this time. So, see you on Sunday, same time. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, Alice. Yes, bye, Ashish, bye, McClosh. Yes, <laughs> bye, Mita. Oh, Katna, bye bye. Bye, bye, Matthias.